This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit HartmanMedia.com. Welcome to the American Monetary Association's podcast, where we explore how monetary policy impacts the real lives of real people and the action steps necessary to preserve wealth and enhance one's lifestyle. Hey, it's my pleasure to welcome Doug back to the show. He's been on many times. You've met him and seen him speak at our Meet the Masters and Profits in Paradise events over the years. Also, he was the one who hosted the Portfolio Makeover Games in various different iterations over the years. And it's great to have him on. Doug, how you doing? Uh, doing great, Jason. I mean, you know, as great as anybody's doing, you know, with the world coming to an end. But Yes. <laughs> well, we're going to get into the world to coming to an end. And we're not so somber about it either, as, as some are. Uh, but, but speaking of the world coming to the end, maybe we'll start right there. You are right now really following more so than before Mark Spitznagel. And That's he, correct. he's the hedge fund manager. He's got a few books out, another one coming out next year. But I, I believe you're currently reading the Tau of Capital, and that's Tau, D-A-O, but pronounced Tau, I believe. And then it's the Austrian investing in a distorted world with forward by Ron Paul, who's, of course, been on the show and spoke at our Meet the Masters event two years ago. So he's really a doom and gloom investor, right? That's correct. And to give the uh, listeners a little bit of context, so... Mark Spitznagel was a student of Nassim Taleb at New York University. And I'm and, a big fan of Nassim. Yes. Yeah. And so Taleb, he wrote uh, Fool by Randomness, Black Swan, Anti-Fragile, probably one of my favorite well, authors. Probably skin my in the top. Game. You must yeah, read Skin, in the, skin game. in the Game. Yes. That's maybe the yeah. most important one of all. Yeah, go. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Skin in the Game and Anti-Fragile, I think, are probably two of the, yeah. are probably his magnum opus. Right. But and the thing that's unique about Spitznagel is that, of course, he has an obviously very bearish perspective, but Universa Capita booked a, I think, 3,612% gain in March of 2020. And if users are saying, I mean, not users, sorry, <laughs> uh, listeners are probably saying, Investors. wait a second, 3,000, so 36X, uh, yes, 36X. And because his whole strategy is about buying, you know, it's largely about options. It's about buying options that are way, 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 way out of the money that they can buy for almost nothing that normally don't pay off. They normally burn capital in time decay. But when a crisis event happens, those types of things just shoot up in value. And in this case, there was a crisis event. Volatilities went up. The uh, Dow went down. The S&P went down. The values shot up and they booked a whole bunch of gains. And so you know, what we can learn from someone like Spitznagel is, A, his strategies, because, of course, the exact strategy is going to be hard for the regular person to implement. But the style of strategy, you know, as he says, the Tao of capital, what he talks about really is the idea of instead of focusing just on how much money you make, focus on how you're positioned so that you will be able to consistently move your position to take advantage of opportunities that come up. Because a lot of times, if you just try to make money now, what you'll end up doing is you'll end up locking yourself into a course of action that you can't very easily adjust. And in the world right now, it's really positioning yourself so that you can be flexible because nobody knows what's going to happen. You know, COVID could, you know, it could take another dip or it could be solved next week. Nobody knows. Right. And I think that's the really important thing that a lot of people can take away from it. And I think that's one of the things that you're really helping people to do with your pandemic investing. Yeah, thanks. I'm beginning to wonder, and I think a lot of people are, but this is sort of easy to say, and I can't say it's hindsight yet, but it feels like we're getting to the the era where this is becoming, it's moving into the background a little bit, right? And everybody's, well, not everybody, but some are now asking, you know, a lot more are asking, was this just a massive overreaction? Uh, of course, the conspiracy theories are flying, and some of those are definitely worth entertaining. I haven't had much time to investigate any of them, frankly, but, you know, we've got to remember something, folks, that if you're in the U.S. or, uh, you know, other countries have similar things, but, you know, in the U.S., we have a constitution, okay? And the government has just 
frankly trampled all over that. And the First Amendment, the very first thing is the, is not only the right to free speech, which, you know, I think we all pretty much have, unless you're on one of the big tech platforms, Facebook, Twitter, the rest, which decide that they're going to censor speech, which is absurd, Google, etc. But the right to peaceably assemble. OK, so what if you wanted to have a political rally right now? You know, you couldn't do it. Right. It's just something we need to remember that, you know, there, there's. Who, who knows? You know, nobody, nobody knows. We may never know really what the significance of this whole thing was and if we've overreacted or, or not. But Spitznagel, now you quoted a 3,600% return, but I'm looking at a thing that says like 4,400%. I think that's yes. the annualized number, right? That's for the whole, that's for the whole year. Yours that's was for, the for year a month. Date. I was for one month. Wow. In one month in March, it was a 3,600% return. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, no, so it what, doesn't do that every year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what did he invest in? Ventilator stock? Or face mask? Or what, um, what? And so actually, I'm actually working with a friend of mine on a, because I think uh, he is, uh, he's good friends with one of the deans of business down at Portland State. And so he spends a lot of time in the Bloomberg lab. And so one of the things that we're working on doing is reverse engineering the trades of universities to figure out what their positions were. But from what I understand, what he, a lot of what he invested in were things like, say, when the S&P you know, was at, like, say, 3,300. Mm -hmm. what, what he would do is he'd buy options at, say, 2,800 or 2,500 okay. or something like that, way, way, way out of the money, which it turns out hit. If you have an option that goes from super far out of the money to all of a sudden now the market price is at the option price, your price just goes up a hockey stick curve. Right. And that's almost certainly what they did because those are going to be your most liquid options. Those are the options you can get for the longest amount of time. Um, you know, and then of course you can also do things like you, know, you can cherry pick weak companies, you know, like of course when Tesla was trading at 900 bucks, that's an easy long-term put, just go way, way out of the money because you know, they're going down, you know, a number of other over leveraged companies that are extremely fragile. Right. It, you know, when you have a research staff that's looking for companies like that you can you know, you can use financial derivatives very effectively that way you know you can also use financial derivatives very ineffectively but you know that's how the game works well what what you're basically doing is just betting on the long shot and so the long shot bet is a cheap bet and the odds are good but again or I'm sorry the the odds aren't good. The odds are terrible. But when it pays, it pays big. That's what pays I meant big. to say. Exactly. It's like, you know, going to the horse races and betting on the horse that never wins. You know, it's the odds are that you're going to lose your money, but you don't lose much and the payoff is big. So uh, exactly. what what does this tell us for real estate investors, if anything? <laughs> Maybe nothing. So, so I think what it tells us for real estate investors is that in the case of Spitznagel, he was positioned to take advantage when there was a big disruption. You know, now most real estate investors aren't going to be allocating you know, say like, you know, $50 million to Universa Capita, you know, but, you know, we, we just don't have the capital base to play in that kind of game. But what we can do is we can make sure that we are uh, adjusting our personal portfolios so that we have the ability to be flexible. Because I know that one of the ideas that you present in the pandemic investing is to have segment your capital between, right, you know, between cash flow, your regular cash flow holdings, to have some speculation for upside, to have some hedging to protect against downside, and to keep some of your holdings just in cash, just in liquid reserves. And I think that construct is really important because what it does is it lets you shift your position as the market, uh, as the market evolves. So for example, one of my clients that I was talking to recently, he has a property in the San Francisco Bay Area that's, it's a multiplex. It's doing very well. And he was concerned about not being able to replace all the cash flow if he took the equity out of that and then reinvested it someplace else. You know, ideally uh, someplace down like, you know, uh, someplace like Texas or Florida. Well, but some of the conversations we've been having are that, you know, the Bay Area right now is basically at or very near a price peak. And of course, it's hard to time the market, but it's hard to imagine that the Bay Area is going to continue appreciating the way that it has in the future. Well, so one way yeah, that you when can... you say at or very near a price peak, you you are insanely optimistic, if you ask me, but go ahead. OK, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, well, and so, so that's the thing. Yeah, the uh, a lot of real estate in the Bay Area is actually probably down off of its peak. Oh, yeah. And it probably 
and it's not probably not going to be back there for a very long time, very long time, you know, because I think the uh, the prior peak was 2007, and it took until I think about what three or four years ago, or something like that. You know, it took almost a full decade to get back to that those peak levels, and it's very likely that it's going to be at least five to eight years before the rec- the peak levels we saw just a couple months ago, before those can be replicated. So the question is, right? You know, if you can pull some equity out of you know of something that you have in a volatile market like say the Bay Area or Southern California or New York, then what you can do is you can say, okay, you know, now you have some flexibility because you have a cash base. And for example, you know, you know, he's very fond of our LMS in Jacksonville area. And so uh, this particular client, he's you know, he's developed a very good relationship with uh, one of our local market specialists down in the Florida area, you know, down on the Florida coast. And one of the things that he really likes that we talk about a lot is how there's a lot of population that's migrating toward Florida. A lot of population from the East Coast is moving toward Florida just because of, you know, the, fa- the favorable weather, the favorable tax status, et cetera. Well, when you have these population migrations, what it does is it puts upward pressure on both price and rents. In all likelihood, in the near future, there's going to be probably more upward pressure on rents. But at the area where our clients are investing, you're also going to have upward pressure on prices because you'll have a lot of people coming down from more expensive real estate. And if we have quality product that's priced below median for an area, right. it, you know, it's very hard It's very hard to imagine a situation where you wouldn't have demand for those types of properties. Doug, this is such a significant trend, and we've been talking about it on the show for you know quite a while now. This mass migration out of high density, expensive areas to low density suburban areas, and it's think of it like this, everybody listening. It's like the person in Las Vegas, who just won a bunch of money. And they're, you know, they go out and they celebrate, and they spend money like a drunken sailor. And that's kind of how it is, or it's it's sort of like when, when we've you know, there, it depends on the era. There have been times when, for example, Australian investors or from any part of the world, but I'll use Australia as an example, because that was a particular one where our dollar made our real estate looked cheap to them. And they came here and bought up stuff like crazy. And even if the the investment wasn't that good, they were simply arbitraging the currency trade, okay? Just the currency trade alone made the deal good, okay? And, you know, that can work both ways, obviously. But when someone leaves New York City with the astronomically overpriced real estate there, and they sell their property even at a loss, or maybe they don't even own, but they take their housing budget and they bring it to a place like Florida, it's like everything looks super cheap to them. And so that they spend more freely. And when they spend more freely into the market, that really puts upward pressure on prices. So this is the trend that is already happening to a small extent, but as these quarantines are lifted, is going to really, really gain steam. And I'm not just talking about New York and Florida. I'm talking about any high-density living anywhere moving into lower-density living where people can socially distance and feel safer. And frankly, that trend was was already underway. This is just putting it on steroids and adding rocket fuel to it because... The trend was already happening, and we've reported on that for years and years. But now it's got legs galore. And if you want to just look at some numbers for a moment, Doug, you're a numbers guy for sure. Absolutely. Um, Let me just tell you about rental units only. This does not, I want to clarify, this does not include condos. This is only rental units, okay? Mid-rise and high-rise buildings in terms of rental units. And during the pandemic investing webinar presentation that we will be announcing soon, we will go into this in greater detail. But there are about 2.3 million of those units now that are mid and high rise. In other words, places where people are trapped in an elevator, a danger zone, and places where most of the time people are using mass transit, another danger zone. That's 2.3 2.3 million units. Now, each unit has maybe two people, for example. If only 15% of those people want to move, and I think that's a small number, by the way. I think it's going to be bigger than that. 
Okay, now, just because they want to move doesn't mean they all will move, whatever. I think there's going to be a higher number than uh, of that in terms of potential movers. That's 340,000 units needed. Spread that among 50 markets. That's another almost 7,000 homes needed in each market in an era when we already had, before any of this, a massive housing shortage. Okay. And, and Jason, I'd actually like to append on what you're saying. Sure. You're saying there's, what, 700,000 homes needed, and they're not 700,000 th- th- homes. 340,000. Okay, yeah, 340,000. The 15% number, mover yeah, number. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they're not 340,000 homes that cost $750,000 exactly. each. Exactly. Yeah. They're 300,000. Fit. There are three hundred thousand homes that probably need to be more in the two fifty, right around in the yeah, in the yeah. sub two fifty, yeah. which there's not a lot of inventory. Right. Well, not only that, but think about if someone owns their high rise condo in New York, they sell it for three million dollars, or say they got to do a fire sale and they sell it for two point five million. So two and a half million dollars, they move to suburbia, and to get a just a gorgeous home in suburbia, they can spend six hundred thousand. Now their housing cost has dropped dramatically. Everybody's worried about the economy being so bad. But look at all the extra spending money that family now has. Look at their ability to buy additional rental properties and the upward price pressure that creates. Okay, so, I mean, our investors following our plan can just win, win, win. Now, I'm not saying the economy is okay, because I don't think it's okay at all. I think the economy's got major problems. But the issue is it's this war between the economy overall and the mass migration trend and how it affects real estate, both rental and for sale real estate in markets we're targeting that you can find at jasonhartman.com slash properties. There's your, uh, there's your Spitznagel hedge fund strategy <laughs> in real estate, right? Well, and I think that the, the two ideas play in because in the Tau of Capital, one of the things that Spitznagel does is he contrasts, well, compares and contrasts uh, Sun Tzu versus Karl von Clausewitz. Because in a lot of cases, a lot so, of people so think, So the okay, art of war, that's Sun Tzu. But what is, then, what is Karl's philosophy? So Clausewitz was a Prussian military thinker in the early, uh, very early 19th century. And he, his book is called On War. And it's about, you know, basically it's about, it's about, you know, tactics and strategy of warfare, but it's really about how warfare is an extension of commerce and more aptly an extension of politics. Meaning that the strategies that are used in warfare can be applied to, you know, can be cross applied to many different, uh, you know, to many, many different spheres years of human existence, right? You know, because you know, a lot of people think, okay, war is just killing people. Well, not quite. There's a lot of strategy involved. And the strategy is how do you position yourself so that your consumption of resources for uh, maintaining your standing army, your ability to defend and your ability to attack plus counter attack are all optimized, you know, because what a lot of people do, especially in the era, is they'd immediately go for a quick win or they'd go for a, you know, uh, for a visible win. In our case, that would be somebody who's going going for as much money as they can make right now. But what that would do is that would lock them into that that would lock them into certain positions that would limit their flexibility. And so what would happen is you'd have, say, for example, one general who would retreat their army, someone would pursue after them, they'd get uh, overextended, and then they could turn their flank and actually defeat a much larger force with a small concentrated force. The, the I think the extension to investors is that flexibility is really important. So, like for example, you're talking about say somebody who moves out of the city. City and moves into the suburbs. And then now they have some extra capital that they can hold in reserve and then they can use to start buying rental properties. And because like, like some clients that I've had, they've said, okay, well, you know, I'm, you know, I'm going to liquidate some holdings. I'm going to have some capital. I'm wondering whether I should deploy it all at once or whether I should hold, sit on it or what I should do. And my, uh, you know, my advice is usually, you know, just make a plan and follow a methodical plan because it might be an L-shaped recovery. It might be a U-shaped recovery. It might be a V-shaped recovery. We don't know. 
And so, you know, what you do when you don't know is just make a plan and be methodical and consistent because then that gives you flexibility. So instead of buying, say, 10 houses right now, maybe you pick up two and then two more and then two more and then two more. But by just being methodical, what that really does is it, you know, it, it gives you that flexibility and that positive movement that will, that will really help you adapt to however the market unfolds because we don't know. Right. And is that another way of saying dollar cost averaging? Exactly. Yeah. Yes. That is a, uh, although, you know, yeah, that, that that's a, uh, a way, uh, you know, it's basically averaging in or, yeah, or dollar cost averaging. Mm-hmm. You know, the way that you would do that, the way that your financial planner would recommend doing that is to just basically put the same amount of money into a mutual fund every single month. Yeah. Um, you know, now, but now think, a lot of uh, the fair warning, though, a lot of times dollar cost averaging is just being used, particularly by the Wall Street uh, cartel, to essentially just get you to keep investing in crappy investments. So, you know, to be fair, I mean, the concept certainly makes sense in some ways, but it's also used as a cover, which is yeah. what I hate about it, you know, so... Well. Yeah. And see, that's the thing. Yeah, yeah. Averaging can't turn a bad investment into a good one. What it can do is it can smooth out your timing so that you don't have to try to figure out the exact top or bottom. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Which nobody can figure out. <laughs> okay, and that is correct. And, and that's uh, that's definitely the thing. So good stuff. You know, let's talk about market timing for a moment. Then we'll wrap it up. So the market timers always, I find them incredibly frustrating and silly. And here's why. Number one, they say things like this. Well, I'm going to keep my cash so I can pounce on all the deals during the next recession. And I'm going to really profit by doing that. Well, that's what they say. But then what they forget to say is that they said this in 2013. And they waited seven years for the pandemic to happen or the recession. We got it this way, which it it was coming anyway, uh, because it's always coming. And they lost out on the opportunity to get any return during that time because they were in cash. So they didn't buy those real estate deals because they thought they were too expensive. They didn't buy the stocks because they thought they were too expensive. So they missed everything. And taxes and inflation ate them alive. So they never calculate the return they lose by waiting. That's a dog that doesn't bark because it's an opportunity cost. And then the other thing that happens is when it comes to real estate, they don't consider their mostly lack of ability to obtain good financing. It's amazing, Doug, how myopic people are. I hear all these economists, like these supposedly brilliant people. One that I'm particularly frustrated with is Robert Schiller, Nobel laureate Robert Schiller, who completely, completely misses the whole concept of real estate. He acts as though everybody buys real estate with cash and their only return on the real estate is the nominal appreciation rather than the multidimensional benefits of that investment. That's one thing. Another thing is his index is two thirds weighted on cyclical markets. Super frustrating. But the thing they don't consider these market timers is the price of the money. They think they're just buying the house. What they're really buying is the mortgage. And they say, well, housing prices have gone way up. In fact, they're at the price they were before the last peak. Okay, and then what happened? We had a recession. But what you didn't notice is what the mortgage payment was at that time versus what the mortgage payment is today. That's the true cost of the house. It's not the price. It's the payment. People don't buy houses on a price. They buy it on a payment. If they bought it on a price, houses would hardly appreciate at all. They're buying it because the payment is affordable, not because the price. They don't care about the price. Nobody says, oh, gosh, this house is $400,000, so it's too much for us. No, they say, okay, the payment on this house now is only $2,000. And gosh, you know, we were looking 12 years ago, and the payment on a house like this, they don't care about the price, just a house like this, square footage, age, neighborhood, etc. okay, was $2,800. It's cheaper now. Houses are cheaper 
Okay, because you evaluate it on a payment, not a price. My God, that seems so simple. But apparently, Nobel laureate economists can't seem to figure that out. Blows my mind. And also, yeah, and uh, and also, I think it goes even a little further than that because. In a lot of cases, people, have, it's like you say, you want to evaluate on a nominal payment, but if you evaluate on a real payment and then deflate for constant value dollars. Oh, yeah. Very good the, point. Uh, sure. The, yeah. yeah, that the real cost of owning houses is actually surprisingly affordable. It's, it's, it's incredibly cheap, really. Yes. So inflation adjusted real dollar mortgage payments. That is the only real metric you should give a lot of weight to. Of course, there are some other things, but that's the one you really look at. And, you know, it's stated fairly clearly in the Housing Affordability Index. So there you go. Doug, any final remarks to wrap this one up? Well, I think the main thing is just that, you know, there's there's a lot of fear out there. And I don't think people need to be afraid. I mean, cautious, yes. Uh, aware, yes. But afraid, no. There's going to be opportunities. And you know, for people who are paying attention and taking action, there, you know, there, there's no reason to think that, you know, that, uh, you know, that the future is going to be, you know, is going to be blighted. You know, the future is going to be difficult for a while, but then it's going to be the future mm-hmm. and there'll be opportunities. So just take them. There's always opportunities, always opportunities. Good stuff. Doug, thank you so much for joining us. Anybody can have you help them with their investment purchases. Go to jasonhartman.com or reach out at 1-800-HARTMAN. And until tomorrow, happy investing. Happy investing. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, hartmanmedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own. And if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.